Okay, so the learning objectives of this <coughs> webinar are just um, essentially to understand the facts, the various facts and situations which can give rise to these sorts of uh, Tolata claims, uh, where a party is claiming uh, or alleging a beneficial interest in properties, and um, to look at some of the contexts in which that was commonly arise. So I'm going to start with the um, with the uh, some key pieces of legislation which set out the background to this uh, relating to formalities and land and then the legislation, uh, to lot it, the Tulata legislation itself. So I'm trying to move, yes, there we are. So section 53 of the Law of Property Act, um, sort of land law 101, um, any declaration of trust respecting land or any interest therein must be manifested and proved in writing. Uh, and then there's the uh, the uh, exception to that, which is resulting in implied or constructive trusts. Similarly, the other key piece of uh, legislation, the Law of Property uh, Miscellaneous Provisions Act, uh, 1989, uh, makes uh, it a requirement that any contract for a disposition of an interest in land can only be made in writing. Um, and again, there's the same uh, sort of exception but nothing that that doesn't uh, it doesn't restrict the creation of resulting implied or constructive trusts, and uh, for reasons of time we haven't gone into prior estoppel. Uh, but the general consensus is that um, because proprietary estoppel isn't a contract, um, Section Two of the Law of Property Act just doesn't apply to proprietary estoppel claims at all. So they're all exempt. They're also exempted. Um, we might touch on it a little bit later, but we've, we've, we've decided to sort of um, leave it to one side for reasons of complexity and, and time. So looking at the Tulata legislation itself, um, I think people can sometimes get a little bit worried about Tulata claims. It sounds a little bit complex, but it, it's really um, extremely, uh, extremely simple. It allows the court to primarily determine whether there is an equitable interest in land and if so the extent of that interest and then it also uh, depended on on the uh, court's view on that matter it allows the court to either uh, uh, allow a party to occupy uh, a property that's <coughs> common in domestic situations where there may be children uh, other factors and in the event of a uh, well, it allows the court to resolve a stalemate whereby two, two parties own a property. Um, one of them wants, their, wants to realize their beneficial interest and the court has the power to order a, a sale of the property. Um, so section 14 uh, deals with applications um, and the court's powers. Uh, so there it is, a court has the power to uh, um, make an order relating to the exercise of the trustees of any other functions. So essentially all of the um, powers of legal ownership, the court can order that the uh, trustees partition the property or sell it or, or do anything else that a legal owner could ordinarily do with the property. Uh, and of course B is declaring the nature and extent of, of the beneficial interest. Um, which, which can be, of course, uh, a very important in fact, as, um, as we'll, we'll refer to later, uh, Connor and I are actually um, reason in part why we're giving this uh, um, seminar is that we were involved in a case where um, my client had actually applied to the court for declaration. Uh, the, the facts were slightly peculiar, we'll come on to them a little bit later. Um, um, and the remedy he sought and was ultimately given was a declaration that he was the 100% uh, beneficial owner. Um, so uh, yeah, extremely, extremely factual, extremely interesting factual background to that case. Um, there was a lot of judicial criticism of both parties in terms of uh, whether or not the judge believed their, their evidence, um, to put it lightly. Um, so we'll come on to that uh, in, in a moment. Um, section 15 sets out the matters that the court will have taken into account when uh, determining applications under Salata. So, sorry, I'm just trying to keep an eye on Q&A in case there are any questions. Um, so essentially the matter is that these are, these are non-exhaustive uh, factors, so the court can also take into account other reasons. Um, 
the intentions of the person who created the trust, the purposes for, for which the uh, property is held, the welfare of any minor, and uh, generally uh, the most important factor in, in practice, the interests of any secured creditor, of any beneficiary. So um, that probably would be so significant if there's an awful lot of equity in the house and if the uh, creditor is a large bank that can afford to sit back and wait. Um, but if it is a creditor who risks going into negative equity, then that will often be a primary consideration that the court, uh, that motivates the court in its, in its decision. So um, that's the legislative background to this. Oh, sorry, I should, before, before we left that, I thought that was a good point to mention a question that had been raised by Gary Levitt at Cousins Hardy. So Gary asked, what is the position in relation to occupational rent when an occupying parent has the children? Russ was going to talk about stacking down later on at the end of this talk, um, which is, of course, the uh, common intention, constructive trust in a family, in a domestic, not un unmarried couple situation. And um, the Court of Appeal in Stack and Darden actually considered this. And um, essentially, because under Section 13, Paragraph 4 of Talata, the court can take, the court must take into account um, the, uh, you know, the purpose for which the, the um, trust was set up and so on. If there are children in occupation, it's extremely unlikely that, that a court would order that, um, that the, usually the, the mother or, or, or the father, whoever's in occupation with the children, um, would pay occupational rent. Um, I don't know if there's anything else you want to say about that, Russell. Yes. No, um, well, just to step back, um, uh, just go back to some uh, brass tanks. Um, occupation rent is an, another, um, it, it's a form of, of equitable accounting and it typically arises in these type of cases where one of the joint owners uh, leaves the property uh, and um, is not welcome back. Uh, that joint owner will be entitled to um, the payment of a notional market rent uh, from the re remaining um, joint owner continues to occupy in relation to his portion of, of the property. Now the issue that um, Mr Leverett raises is if, if the parties uh, have children, uh, then, um, you know, how is, that, uh, how is that affected? And as, um, as, as, Connor, uh, as Connor stated, I think at the very least, uh, a court is likely to, um, uh, whereas normally, um, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the, the joint owner who leaves the property will be entitled to uh, uh, market rent on 50% of the property. I think whether a children, minor children, um, at the very least, uh, I think the court is, is likely to heavily discount that amount. Yeah, actually, I agree. Yeah. Actually, actually, in the um, Supreme Court, the, the more recent Supreme Court case of Jones and Kerner, paragraph 50, it was actually suggested um, that where uh, minor children are um, left in the property, the court is, it, it, it's quite possible the court will uh, award no occupation. Right? Um, so so um, perhaps the most likely outcome will be that there won't be an award uh, of occupation rent to the non-occupying um, uh, partner until such time as the children reach uh, majority. But it is conceivable that a portion of it may be awarded, but it will be heavily discounted from the normal 50%. Yeah, I think the only other point to make in relation to that is even in family matters, um, the court will, will first, the first stage will, will the court will just be looking at the property rights, including, as we just said, the intentions of the party in setting up the trust and, and the, the wishes of the beneficiaries. Um, and then it will consider up after that uh, any family sort of legislation or, or, or family support obligations are, are a second step, which um, which we won't be looking at in this talk. Of course, this is a primary uh, property. Uh, but of course, it's even talk. it's even contained within this section fifteen one C welfare of any minor. 
to occupy yes. reasonably yeah. space. So that can clearly come in to uh, yeah. the, the artifact. Okay, so now, now we're coming to the main uh, substance of our talk. So this will be divided into three sections. First of all, Russell's going to talk about resulting trusts. Um, then uh, I'm going to talk about, uh, co uh, about constructive trusts um, in the sense of the Palant and Morgan equity. So that's essentially uh, a commercial transaction usually whereby the parties have agreed something, but it's fallen far of the formality requirements that we talked about earlier. So uh, it's not, nothing's been made in writing or it hasn't been made with, uh, the agreement hasn't been made with sufficient certainty. And then the third and final um, area is common intention constructive trusts. So those are the Stack and Darden family homes, domestic context talks. And, and again, Russell's going to then handle that. Um, so Russell, do you want to take over from here? Yes, yes. So um, I'm going to start with a, a brief discussion of resulting trusts. And of course, um, uh, at the risk of stating the obvious, what we're talking about is um, uh, trusts which arise when there is uh, no sort of written trust instrument. Obviously, when there's a written trust instrument, um, in most cases, in most cases, uh, that is going to, uh, if not all cases, that it, that is going to be the base upon which the um, the uh, the court proceeds. Um, I always I say in most cases because, of course, as most of us know, no. Um, uh, to every uh, to every hard and fast rule, there, there's always an exception. Now, in relation to resulting trusts, um, as a basic pr uh, principle, there are two types of resulting trust. I'm going to focus on um, the presumed resulting trust because that is the one which uh, arises in relation, almost always, in relation to real property uh, when the, the question of resulting trust does arise. The other type of um, resulting trust is the quiz close. Uh, is what's known as a quiz close trust. Now, it's much less likely to arise, if at all, in the uh, real property context. So the quiz close trust is a um, type of trust which arises where a creditor lends money to a debtor for a specific purpose. And in certain circumstances where um, the um, debtor uses uh, that money other than for the specific purpose which it was lent, that money um, can be traced and will be held on resulting trust uh, for the creditor. Um, so that, uh, so we'll put quiz close trusts to one side and focus on um, a presumed resulting trusts or presumed intention resulting trusts. And it's actually quite useful to, um, uh, when when talking uh, uh, about this. Uh, Connor, I'm going to ask you to move on to the next slide because I think you yes. have um, um, to, to, to actually use all terms presumed intention resulting trust. And, and the reason I say that is because um, although there are, there are a sort of rules of, uh, 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 rules of, uh, sort of law as to what will be presumed um, absent any contrary evidence and um, the focus is still ultimately on the intention of the parties so these presumptions um, which have grown up um, um, are always uh, rebuttable uh, by evidence um, the standard uh, rule or the standard um, uh, instance in which a presumed resulting trust arises is where monies are provided by uh, for the purchase of a property at the time it was purchased by person A and yet the legal title of that property um, is conveyed into the name of person B. In such a circumstance, this is the cleanest example of a resulting trust, in such um, a, a circumstance, uh, person B will hold um, the, uh, all other things being equal, will hold the property on resulting trust for person A. So as I've said, it gives effect uh, to a default presumption about the intention of the transferor in certain yeah, so it's, it's, worth, it's worth mentioning that because of, because of what, what Russell's just said, it's, it's actually fairly, uh, 
it's much less significant now because um, there, there almost always will be some evidence of the actual intention of the party, which can either rebut or uh, support that presumption. So the presumption, the presumed intention resulting trust is just a starting point. So it's just a presumption in the absence of any other evidence. Yeah. Um, I think it's probably most useful in a context where a party can't uh, plead particular facts because it would get them into trouble. Um, <laughs> Yes. You know, <laughs> for, yeah. I'm not sure how, how to put that uh, delicately. Um, and actually, in our case, there was some delicacy uh, because um, essentially um, Russell's client wasn't able to secure a mortgage because of, I think it was credit rating, or, or he, in any case, he, 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 couldn't, he couldn't qualify for a mortgage. So he came along to my client and said, can we take out a mortgage in your name? Which... Um, uh, well, essentially, they hadn't been forthright in their mor mortgage application, and they hadn't told the truth, and that could have gotten them both into quite a lot of trouble. So, we, whilst we initially uh, raised that as an issue, that's something that we both dropped on the basis that it wouldn't be in the interest of either party to uh, to get into what to get into the truthfulness of of, of the mortgage application. Yes. So that that case is, and we'll come on to that in a moment. Is um um, Tahir and, uh, and Faizi, which ultimately ended up in the High Court. Um, now, <clears throat> and as I say, we'll come, we'll come on to that in a moment. The classic formulation of the um, resulting trust rule that I've just articulated it is found in the case of Dyer and Dyer. And you'll see there, a clear result of all the cases, without a single exception, is that the trust of a legal estate the freehold, copyhold or leasehold were the taking in the names of the purchasers and others jointly or in the names of others without that of the purchaser, whether in one name or several, whether jointly or successful, successive results to the man who advances the purchase money. So we, we get to the rule at the end and more recently it's been, and more straightforwardly perhaps it was stated um, by Lord Upjohn in Pettit and Pettit um, as follows, in the absence of evidence the contrary in full qualification, if the property be conveyed into the name of a stranger, he will hold his trustee for the person putting up the purchase money. And if the purchase money has been provided by two or more persons, uh, the property is held for those persons in proportion to the purchase money that they have provided. That latter part of that rule, <coughs> um, if the purchase money has been provided for two or more persons, the property is held for those persons in proportion. The purchase money that they've provided reflects the uh, decisions, as I've said there, uh, as is on the slide of early case of Rogers' question, bull and bull, and it sort of follows. So effectively, if person A, in our example, provides seventy-five percent of the purchase money at the type of time of purchase, um, and, per and person B provides twenty-five percent, but the um, property is conveyed, or the legal title of the property is conveyed, um, into the name of person B, he will hold it uh, um, the 75% on trust for person A, but he will be entitled to the 25%. Um, yeah, so again, that second paragraph was uh, relevant in our claim because um, my client had, well, essentially the finding was that Russell's client had in fact transferred, even though my client was the legal owner, um, Russell's client uh, transferred to the um, mortgage lender the deposit for the property. Um, my client had nevertheless taken out the legal mortgage, say half a million, and was liable to repay that, and therefore took, took ownership of the half a million pounds that was used to pay the rest of the, um, of the uh, purchase price. So my argument was, okay, Russell's client has that 5 or 10% resulting trust for his contribution to the purchase money. But my client still provides a lion's share, even if he has um, uh, had to borrow it in questionable circumstances. And even if, even if, um, well, essentially, even though, even though this was uh, perhaps Russell's client's intention that this be purchased as a property for him, uh, that because my client had provided most of the money, then that should result to him. Uh, and be held on a, on a resulting trust. 
So ultimately the question there was, um, as we'll come in a moment, is um, insofar as there had been, it was found as a fact that there had been agreement between the parties that Connor's client would take out a mortgage for the purposes of buying the property on behalf of my uh, client. Given that he was liable uh, to the mortgage company, for the purposes of determining the resulting trust and or uh, um, resulting trust principles, for the, determined, the purposes of determining um, to whom that, um, uh, those mortgage monies were attributable or from whom they were advanced at the time of purchase, um, you know, what, what was the situation? Ultimately, the court found that they were to be attributable or they were, they were to be taken to have been advanced by my client on the basis that my client had entered into a contract of indemnity with Connor's client. We'll come, as I say, we'll come on to that in, yeah. in a moment. So the, although Connor's client was, um, uh, was on the hook, so to speak, uh, to the mortgage company, we were on the hook, or my client was on the hook uh, personally um, to Connor's client um, for any money that Connor's client um, ended up paying to the, uh, to the mortgage company. And for that reason, those monies were taken as having advanced from my client. There was some, going back to sort of the more general scene, there was some tension in the authorities and there was a lot of discussion um, in the early, uh, late 90s, early 2000s um, as to whether or not um, the presumption of resulting trust is premised upon the common intention of the parties, a common intention as suggested by Lord Brown Wilkinson in West Deutsche and Landers Bank or the absence of a positive intention to confer benefit on a transferee, as suggested by Lord Militant twin, twin Secretary. I think on balance, the commentators, although it was never finally decided, on balance, the commentators seem to have um, lent towards uh, Lord Millet's interpretation, but um, for the vast majority of claims, this is unlikely to make much of a difference in practice, which is perhaps why it's not finally uh, been determined by the courts. But it's useful to know that that is a doctrinal dispute which, you know, hovers in the background and may, and may become relevant uh, um, at a later stage. Now, as, as I said at the outset, the presumption uh, of a resulting trust can... Uh, it, it, is a presumption as to the intention of the parties. And because of that, it's always been held that it can be displaced by evidence um, of a contrary intention. Uh, but to complicate matters a little further, the presumption of resulting trust is also itself subject to a counter presumption, which is known as the presumption of advancement. That too can be rebutted uh, by counter evidence. So if notwithstanding all of these sort of evidential rules, if there is clear evidence, parole evidence, the intention of the parties, uh, then that will trump presumptions. But the presumption of advancement arises where the donor or purchaser is the husband or parent of the person to whom the property is transferred. So in such cases, the property is then presumed to have been um, given absolutely as a gift rather than on trust. So if I have an 18 year old, oh, sorry, if I have a son under the age of 18 or even over the age of 18 in classically formulated, and I say to him, right, I, um, um, I'm going to, uh, or so I purchase property uh, and I transfer it into his name, then Whereas if he was a stranger, it, it would be, absent any other, other evidence, it would be treated as being held by him on trust for me. Because he's my son, um, 
uh, that that will not arise. In fact, it will be presumed that um, he holds it absolutely. The traditional position in relation to that is the, to this rule is the presumption of advancement applies only from transfers made by fathers to their children, but not transfers by mothers to their children. I think it's more or less accepted and certainly uh, seems to have been accepted by Lord Neuberger in um, Alaska and Alaska that this is uh, a rule which uh, restriction of the presumption to fathers um, now um, it was of its time and that now it will apply both to fathers and mothers. There's also been some suggestion that the presumption is weakened when it involves the transfer of property between a parent and child who's over 18 as long as that child, there's some evidence that their child's managing his own affairs, but that remains the, the subject of, of, of some disputes. So the basic rules sort of stands that um, uh, the presumption will operate uh, when uh, property is being transferred into the name of uh, a child uh, absent other evidence. So in some then, um, the bringing these strands together, it's important to note the following things. Firstly, the presumption of resulting trust arises in respect of a property at the time of the property's purchase, and it does so automatically. It's a presumption which operates in favour of the party advancing the purchase monies. As such, it's a presumption which can be rebutted by parole evidence. It's subject to the counter-presumption of advancement, which itself um, can uh, be rebutted by parole evidence. But where there's a direct agreement between the parties, um, and there's evidence of that, that will, if fortiori, be sufficient to confirm or rebut uh, either presumption. Um, the presumed, uh, sorry, the, an, an important, latterly an important um, distinction uh, has uh, arisen between the domestic couple context and the consumer context. The case of Jones and Kernot, uh, which is the uh, latest big Supreme Court case in this area, has confirmed that the presumption of resulting trust will not apply in the domestic couple context, where instead the informal and common intention trust principles will apply and I'll deal with those later. Um, however, in a situation where, uh, sorry, I'll, I'll deal with that variety of trust in, in, in due course. In a situation, however, where the parties are in a domestic relationship or arrangement, but the purchase of the disputed property forms part of some form of commercial enterprise or part of an investment, rather than a shared home, then in the case of Laska and Laska, it was held that in those circumstances, the resulting trust principles will still uh, uh, apply. Um, so it's very important, context is very important here. I should I think, add- I think briefly, I think Laska and Laska is probably the closest uh, case to, to ours. And I think you relied on it, didn't you? It, yes, yes, I did. I should add that there is a little that there, there is there is a bit of a fly in the ointment because subsequent to Lasker and Lasker and Jones and Kerno, there was the, case, the Privy Council case of Mara and Colley, uh, which was an appeal from the Bahamas, and that dealt with a situation where there were two gentlemen in a domestic relationship, and they uh, made purchases. Um, which were for a domestic purpose, but also for a commercial purpose. They did make some sort of investment. And that was distinguished from um, Lasker and Lasker, because in Lasker and Lasker, the purchase was made by a mother and her daughter for an investment purpose. But they didn't live together and never intended to live together. And it was from a, it was, it was to form a purely um, a purely sort of commercial um, uh, arrangement. 
in Marr and Colley, they distinguished it on the basis that although the portfolio did involve in, uh, commercial investment, it was with the intention, and again, the emphasis was on the intention, with, with the intention that the parties would together as domestic partners enjoy the benefit in future of that um, investment. Um, just, so I'm just looking at the time. Uh, I'm conscious Russell and I had planned to uh, finish by within 45 minutes and then allow questions for the last 10 or 15 minutes. Yes. So yes. we're probably running slightly behind that, but we'll yes. do our best to yeah. sort of... Yeah. So, so, our case, our, so our case, notwithstanding those, the, 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 um, what I've just said in, in relation to the distinction between um, a domestic, a largely domestic context and a purely commercial context, our case, uh, was a situation in which the two um, gentlemen obviously were not in the best relationship, but they were friends. And um, and this is the, the case of Tahir and Faisi. Um, um, but, um, but Mr. I think just touching on that point, Russell, uh, it is quite, I mean, they're, they're, these, these two gentlemen were from a culture whereby uh, there was a lot of trust within this community. And even though they weren't blood, blood relations, they would have thought, they would have yeah. called each other cousins, I think. And um, an awful lot of trust. And actually, I've seen an awful lot of these cases come from yeah. people from that, that sort of culture yeah. whereby there's an awful lot of trust and nothing's written down and they don't go and see a lawyer first. And yeah. they just trust each other. And then 10, 20 years down the line, they've got a property that's suddenly worth a million pounds. And someone decides that they quite like to <laughs> to keep. That, that, that's it. absolutely that's absolutely correct. I mean, that's been my experience as well. I mean, I think we've the, the slide there says says what was found by the by, by the judge and reasons for finding it. If anybody has questions, we can address those. But I think, given time, I'll now pass on to um, Connor to deal with and to Morgan. Yeah. So I'm now going to deal with the first category of uh, constructive trust, which is the Pound and Morgan equity. Um, there are other uh, potentially um, innumerable categories of constructive trust, but the significant one, the significant two in the context of real property are going to be piled in Morgan equities and <coughs> common intention trusts, uh, which Russell will then deal with the second of those two. So dealing with the palant and Morgan equity, these are the three um, ingredients in your typical claim. A agrees with B that A will purchase property for the benefit of both. Um, secondly, in reliance on that assurance or promise or expectation, B either um, helps A or um, refrains from competing with A so that A can um, acquire the property on uh, better terms than he would have been able to do so otherwise. So the example I've given there, and in fact the case in Palantin and Morgan, was a case of a property auction whereby uh, two uh, essentially, two two uh, individuals had entered into a, a sort of a partnership or a fiduciary <coughs> arrangement um, that the second of the two wouldn't wouldn't enter into competition on the auction, and that then they'd go into partnership on a joint venture uh, to develop the property afterwards. And the third uh, fact, the third uh, ingredient is that uh, as a result, it would be unconscionable for A to keep the property for himself. Um, so essentially, it's the best way to look at it, I think, is a sort of uh, agency relationship, uh, well, there's a fiduciary obligation. And um, the other point that's, worth, that's very important to make is that we're in, the, in the kind of constructive trust that Russell's going to talk to you about, it's all very, uh, I don't want to say woolly, but really sort of formalities go out the window and there, there is uh, an awful lot of... Um, uh, the court will sort of divine the party's intentions, whereas in this kind of commercial context, the courts really do uh, require require a clear and final agreement at the outset. So it's much more akin to contract um, than to a sort of almost remedial constructive trust. So I'm going to mention two cases. The first is Clark and Cordes. Um, and this is one that I relied on heavily in, in, in the case between Russell and I. Um, first, although it doesn't have to be up to the standards of contractual certainty, there does have to be a, a express accord between the parties. 
So <clears throat> um, Russell mentioned that there was a contract of indemnity. Uh, when I'd been cross-examining Russell's client, um, well, <laughs> as my, my interpretation was that Russell found had denied that he'd be responsible uh, or on the hook in any way for this mortgage loan, <coughs> um, which is um, which is a point I'll come back to in a, in a moment. Uh, secondly, um, so unconscionable uh, behaviour is a necessary condition, but it's not insufficient uh, in itself. It is um, to protect them from the unintended uh, legal consequences of resulting from um, informal relationships. And third, um, there must be reliance. So again, that's another, another ingredient that sets it apart from a uh, contract. It's not enough to simply say we agreed this, therefore I'm entitled to my expectation. Um, we have to show that unless the court sort of um, intervenes, that there will be some kind of uh, injustice or unconscionable conduct. Uh, and then this is the second case, which I also relied on. Um, the second paragraph is the one I'm going to focus on. Uh, an agent is usually entitled to an indemnity from his principal against costs incurred. It's clear that the claimant was not prepared to commit itself to such a liability. The lack of a liability on the part of the claimant uh, to indemnify uh, was a clear signal that no agency was created. So again, that was the point I was seeking to establish is that uh, if Russell's client is saying no, I, I wasn't responsible for the um, loan. That that was um, that was Connor's client's problem. Uh, and my point was that without that indemnity, you can't have the benefit of this uh, alleged fiduciary relationship without bearing the burden of the indemnity. Um, although it didn't work, <laughs> of course. Um, right. So that was the that was a very brief run through uh, because we're being pressed for time of the commercial appellate and Morgan uh, context. Russell's now going to finish up with the domestic context constructive trust. Yes, yes, and and of course this is this is often probably the most common um, situation in which an informal uh, an informal trust is is found to arise, uh, uh, which is why it's been the subject of uh, so much. Um, consideration at the uh, at a high level. It arises when land is purchased as a joint home but where the registered legal title doesn't reflect the beneficial shares with which the uh, proprietors intended for themselves uh, and it's essentially in the a domestic context or um, arises out of or with um, out of uh, a domestic uh, sort of, uh, uh, relationship um, uh, the leading case, the first leading case in this area is that of Stack and Dowden in 2007, where the basic rule was laid down uh, that, as I said, in the domestic context or where there's sort of a domestic, an ongoing domestic relationship and the property is bought as part of that um, uh, domestic uh, relationship or with that domestic relationship in view joint tenants who haven't um, expressly declared the extent of their the, uh, respective beneficial interests are presumed to hold the property in equal shares according to the number of joint tenants. And it established the following uh, proposition. Now, paradoxically, in both Stack and Dowden and uh, Jones and Kernow, um, all the um, these pro propositions were laid down as a starting point and then the court went on to, certainly in the case of Jones and Kernow, found actually, well, notwithstanding these basic principles, the facts of, these, of this particular case was that um, we should depart from, 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 from the norm. The basic principles were that first, um, a conveyance into joint aim indicates both the legal and beneficial joint tenancy unless until the contrary is, is proved. So effectively, it's saying in the domestic context, uh, equity follows the law, the presumption of resulting trust is not a, appropriate. So just to, just to interrupt there, we've got a question from, um, from Scott Ainsley. Why are they called tenants and not owners? It's a bit feudal, isn't it? <laughs> That's a very, it's a very good question. Um, <laughs> I can't remember the reason why they don't talk about ownership in English law. 
think it's because it's something to do with the crown owning everything and then everyone else just owns a freehold. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, it is. It, it is. It probably is feudal. I, well, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, as Mr. Ainsley says, it is. Uh, it is a bit feudal. He might have been saying that tongue in cheek, but in fact, it is because the whole of our land law is um, prem arises out of uh, our, our sort of the feudal, yeah. uh, uh, feudal ar arrangement um, subsequent to the uh, yeah subsequent to uh, the Norman invasion, yes. Ah, and helpfully we've got uh, another, we've got quite a property effort, Richard Cherry confirms uh, exactly all tenants of the Crown yeah. uh, under Norman uh, law. Thank you, Richard. <laughs> yes, he's, he's one of our, he's, he's one of our tenants in chief. Anyway, um, and so, so, in the, so yeah, the second proposition that second down laid down was because the legal and beneficial uh, joint tenancy is only a presumption, just as the results in trust, uh, it's only a presumption. It's open to either party to try to establish that uh, there's a different, uh, the, the proportions of ownership are different. There's an unequal division. This can be inferred or imputed from the party's conduct in relation to the property over the whole course of their relationship. But, um, Lady Hell said uh, that it's a case in, in which joint legal owners are, to the case, case in which joint legal owners are intended uh, that their beneficial interests should be different will be very unusual. And just, so have, I, have I jumped ahead on the slides? I, just, I think I, you have, yes, on slide 22. Yeah. Um, um, the burden, finally, is on the person propounding an unequal division to show that the parties intended their beneficial interests to be different from their legal interests. So essentially what um, Stack and Dowden did was it's, it replaced one um, presumption with another. So in the domestic context, it said the uh, resulting trust presumption no longer applies. It's a presumption that equity follows the law. But again, the important thing is the underlying intention of the parties. And so if there is evidence uh, uh, that the, um, the that the ownership should be different or or have in uh, uh, in unequal portions, then then that will ultimately uh, that that intention will ultimately uh, displace the uh, the presumption that equity follows the law. Um, the next case, um, or, or the next time the Supreme Court had uh, occasion to. Uh, to revisit this matter was Jones and Kernow, and it basically built upon built upon Stack and Dowden, but developed a few more sort of developed its thinking a little further and, and laid down five propositions. The first was that the starting point, as with Stack and Dowden, is that equity follows the law, and joint tenant, and that uh, where the parties um, or sort of where the, the legal ownership records that. Um, that the parties own the property jointly, um, that would be the that would be the default position. However, secondly, the presumption can be displaced by showing first that the parties had a different common intention at the time when they acquired the home, or b that they later formed the common intention that their respective shares would change. That is. Um, so what it's added to Stacking Dowden is the, the idea that, or what it's made explicit of Stacking Dowden, is that um, the proportions of ownership um, can change over time. Now, um, you know, hard-bitten trust lawyers, I think, probably stand aghast at that, but I think what the... Um, what the what the Supreme Court was trying to trying to do is to try to take account of 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 you know real life relationships and and the realities on the ground. Yeah, it's a pretty revolutionary. Um, well, not revolutionary. It's a bit, bit far, but it's pretty um, from from a property perspective, it is quite revolutionary, I suppose. And it's really the court. Um, it's almost like a rolling. Lines. 
Yes, yes. It yeah, it's really socioeconomic policy, really, in light of the fact that most people, a lot of people, aren't married today, and um, yeah, high up their so, their wealth in, in property. Absolutely. So the the third presumption is that the common intentions to be deduced objectively from the context of the parties, and um, it approved a uh, formulation of Lord Lord Diplock and Gissin Gissin. The relevant intention of each party is the intention which was reasonably understood by the other party to be manifested by the party's word and conduct, notwithstanding that he did not consciously formulate the intention in his own mind. So basically it's the notion of objective intention. You know, you, you may have a different intention in your mind if you don't objectively manifest it. So in other words, if, if there's no um, yeah, evidence of reasonably uh, an objectively manifested intention, then uh, uh, of course that would have one to operate. Um, and examples of the sort of evidence which may be uh, relevant um, uh, references made back to what was said in Stack and Dowden. And so okay, fourthly, this is, this, yeah, our last slide. In those, in those cases where it's clear either A, that the parties did not intend a joint tenancy at the outset, or B, had changed their original intention, but it's not possible to ascertain by direct evidence or by inference that their actual intention uh, was as to the shares in which they would own the property. The answer is that in each is entitled to that share which the court considers fair, having regard to the whole course of dealings between them in relation to the property. So effectively what the court is saying, if it's clear that um, from, the, from the evidence that equity should not follow the law, and that the parties did not in in intend uh, that the property should be owned um, uh, equally at the outset, or that intentions changed. But it's not possible to go on from there on the basis of the evidence to determine what portions or proportions they, um, uh, they intended the property to be held in to be owned as between them, then it will be for the court to step in and effectively do equity and determine what will be fair under the circumstances. Mm -hmm. So the whole course of dealings, of dealing rather, which is a term which was used by Baroness Hale in Stack and Dowden, um, it will be relevant in, in relation to the property and should be given, uh, and determining this question, should be given a broad meaning enabling a similar range of facts to be taken into account as may be relevant to ascertaining the party's actual intentions were they available. And then finally, each case, looking these, these judgments, each case will turn on its own facts. The financial contributions will be relevant, but they won't be determinative. And that, again, is building upon the, 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 the fact that this is a domestic context and that Financial considerations, of course, will be very important, but they're not the only factors. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Russell. Uh, yep. Just uh, whilst you were talking, I, I realised I'd meant to mention property estoppel briefly when I was discussing the um, Palatine Morgan equity. It's, it's, I think, one judge called it a sister claim to a constructive trust, the property estoppel, and um, I think. It's worth thinking very carefully if you are bringing a claim for someone who's alleging proprietary estoppel because um, there are different kinds. There's, there's estoppel by acquiescence, estoppel by representation, estoppel by promise. And depending on which one you go for, it, I mean, estoppel by representation, for example, doesn't uh, find a cause of action. And also, um, you need to think very carefully about what facts you're alleging and um, why the present situation makes it unconscionable uh, for the other party to go back on their um, acquiescence or, or representation or promise. Um, so we didn't have time to touch on it today, but I just wanted to say, don't assume that it's um, a complete overlap with constructive, uh, with a con claim for a constructive trust. Um, no, they can and, be, a, they, yeah, they yeah. can be, they can be different. The, um, yeah. Um, now, I just want to deal with, with one question that um, Scott Ainsley um, submitted prior to the talk, and that is, is its latter claim weakened as time goes by 
so if, for example, at the time that a relationship breaks down, uh, the individual doesn't want the children in the property or, or the children in the relationship to worry about um, uh, the departing party forcing the sale of the house, um, and you hold off making it a larger claim, will they, um, uh, will, will that weaken the claim, you know, as time goes by, if you hold off for sort of several years or possibly even 10, 10 years? I think the answer to that depends very much upon the facts of the case. Firstly, there's the question as to whether or not uh, the departing party continues to pay the mortgage, continues to um, discharge other uh, liabilities in relation to the property. If they don't, then of course their proportion, uh, especially if it's a repayment mortgage, then of course the proportion can shift uh, according uh, that they've been entitled to, can, it can shift. It may conceivably also conceivably uh, uh, be subject to the doctrine of leches. And the doctrine of leches is that if you fail to um, assert your beneficial uh, interest, especially if the other party, as a result of that delay, um, acts to their detriment, then you can be debarred from uh, asserting your beneficial interest. Now, um, I think that's it, I mean, so Leitch's is considered now to be um, a, a, a weak uh, defence, but it still, it still operates. And although I think it's largely, it, it's, it's unlikely to play a, to play a factor in, in, in um, the domestic context, in most instances, uh, in most domestic disputes, um, it, it certainly can't be ruled out. So it's something to bear in mind. Yeah, so late is a kind of uh, equitable limitation bar, yes. um, but a very, a very loose one. Um, one more question from Gary Leverett. Uh, in Kernet and Jones, the non-occupying party had not paid any maintenance, so it's understandable that no occupational rent was to be paid. But would the non-occupier have to give account for the mortgage paid by the occupier? Whether the non-occupier pays full maintenance, is occupational rent payable? And should they also have to pay their shares of mortgage if they pay full maintenance as well? Quite, quite, a, but <laughs> quite a few questions Good. there. So what, what, I'll, what I'll say is, it, it's something I mentioned earlier, is that the court will firstly look at the property, um, property rights uh, in accordance with property law principles. Um, and then I think any, any sort of maintenance is going to be a separate, whether that stems from a... Uh, uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not a family specialist, so if, if that stems from a, a family uh, law obligation to pay maintenance, then I think that would be a secondary um, issue that wouldn't be taken into account when, I, when, when uh, determining the property, the extent of the property interests of the parties. Well, um, yeah, sorry, also. Sorry, no, I was just going to say, so uh, Mr. Leverett's uh, come up with, with, with three questions, and, and of course he's right to say non-occupying parties need to pay maintenance. Um, would the, the, so the first question is, would the non-occupier have to give an account for the mortgage paid by the occupier? Well, in my view, again, it's only in my view, um, uh, yeah, yes, yes, I think he, he probably so we, would. This, if, this, if, this, this came up in our case, didn't it, Russell? Because we, uh, had, a, we, had, we had submissions on equitable accounting. And yes. uh, as I recall, it was the courts. The courts make a sort of a distinction between capital payments and interest payments. Yes. Now, the reality of, of uh, modern mortgages is that most or a lot of them are primarily interest only, or at least interest only for a large um, portion of the mortgages. So the courts um, es essentially they can they can be quite flexible. And I well, think it just depends on, on the individual facts, whether yes. or not. Yeah. But I, I, I do think that in relation to this, because of course it's a liability, whether it whether or not it's an interest only payment or a um or a um, um a repayment mortgage, I think that they are both liabilities on the property. So my view is that the court will probably say if the non occupier um, wants to maintain the same proportion of entitlement, he is likely to have to continue to assist in paying the mortgage, wh whichever type of mortgage it is. Um, 
Uh, otherwise, there is a danger that the proportions might shift in, in, in due course. Um, the second question is whether the non-occupier pays full maintenance, is occupation rent payable? Um, I think that that is a more interesting question, and I think it is conceivable, it is conceivable that that will be taken into account and that the court might find in those circumstances that a certain amount of occupation rent will be payable. What proportion that would amount to, I think, um, will be an interesting question. And of course, um, it's not just a question of um, maintaining the children um, financially. There may be, given what was said at the end of Jones and Kerno, it's also, there are other questions in play, non-financial questions in play. They may be taken into account by the, um, by the court. And then finally, he says, should they also have to pay their share of the mortgage if they pay uh, full maintenance as well? Again, that's interesting. Now, that may, in my view, be affected by the type of mortgage um, If it's a repayment yeah. mortgage, I think in order for them to potentially maintain um, their proportion of the interest in the property, yes, they would need to, to, to continue paying it. If it's an interest only mortgage, I think it might be a slightly more balanced question. I mean, I don't think there are any hard and fast rules on this. Um, mm -hmm. But that, that's just my initial sort of take on those. On those yeah, that, that, that was the thing that struck me uh, as surprising, but actually it, make, it makes sense about the equitable accounting principles is um, because you can have a situation where you're paying interest only, but they can be equivalent in, you know, to rent. Like you could have an interest only mortgage where you're paying one or two thousand pounds interest a month. Um, or you could have... I mean, it, really, it's just it, it, the court looks at it with a broad brush and determines roughly how much has, has each party contributed um, and roughly how, what's a fair division um, or what's a fair uh, extent of beneficial interest to allocate to each party. Yeah. So um, it's quite an interesting I think they're very, very, very interesting questions that, that Mr. Lever raises. And, and indeed, they are the type of questions which courts will have to grapple with. Um, mm. uh, and I think you, you sort of can find within the um, Supreme Court authorities assistance uh, as to what, may, what courts may conclude, but um, there, there is still a wide degree of discretion. Yeah, it didn't, it didn't arise in the end because your client won 100% of the property, yes. so there's no, yes. no need to determine fact, the equitable yeah, in, in our case, which is, which is slightly different, in our case, um, um, submissions were asked by the, in fact, the judge, the trial judge raised it a, as an issue whilst I was in, 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 for, in closing. Um, um, and my submissions were essentially that in that, in this case, uh, um, uh, the, the question of equitable accounting didn't arise. And I think he accepted that submission. Okay, so are there any last questions? Uh, we'll, we'll see if there are any questions that we can deal with in a question and answer session. Um, unless we, <laughs> unless everyone's had enough and they want to go and enjoy the sunny weather. Well, thank you very much for everybody for uh, sort of sticking it through to the end. Um, um, it's, an, it's a fascinating area and um, certainly uh, the case that Connor and I were involved in uh, required us to grapple with the with, with these issues, mm -hmm. and um, and they are they are in, in, important. So we hope that what we've said today um, will um, will be of some assistance to to, to, to the participants. Th thank you for uh, giving us your time uh, to attend. Yeah. So if I think if there's just one thing I would say to sum it up. This is an area more than any other that really just depends on the individual facts of your case. Um, okay, so yeah, thank you, thank you very much for attending. Um, we, could, we, we have a plug for next week's seminar. Oh yes, yes. 
So um, there is an excellent uh, Richard Cherry uh, and Zach Bredemeyer are going to be talking about, so I think it was last week or two weeks ago, Richard was in the Court of Appeal. Is that right? Anyway, it basically um, on an issue about uh, Section 21, notices for possession and uh, service of a valid uh, gas. Handed yes, down, was, last was handed down last week. Yep. Uh, it, might, it might well go to the Supreme Court. Um, I don't know, but really interesting, very technical area of law, easy to get lost in. And, and I've actually had attended a seminar that Richard gave on this previously. And it's very, uh, very helpful, I think, if you do any sort of possession work to know about this gas safety issue, because it could be a real uh, spanner in the work. So it, 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 it really can be. Um, and I'm sure landlords, if anyone works with landlords, they, they know all about that. Right, so um, do, is that next Thursday, Russell? I, I believe I believe it is yes, and I believe that Richard Cherry on that case is going to is going to deal with the, the case of Trekkenal House, uh, which is handed down, and, and Zachary Redder yeah. is going to deal with statutory interpretation section so, one notices. Yeah, so, so Richard Richard uh, appeared for the tenant, I think, in that case in the Court of Appeal. Anyway, um, yeah, so Zach's dealing with uh, st the statutory uh, interpretation of section twenty one. Uh, so really, really uh, I, I, I've attended a sort of an earlier uh, form of that seminar. I, I really recommend it. Well, thank you as, again for everybody to, uh, giving us uh, giving uh, your time to us, and I hope it's been of, of assistance. Thanks very much. Thanks. All right. Thank you, everyone.